would like to welcome Peppa. And um, she is currently in Spain and she's the director for Reproductive Maternal Newborn and Child Health. Um, she's been uh, 20 years experience working as an independent midwife and she also um, manages and develops for organisations and public-private partnerships. She's also the Secretary, Secretary General, I think I've got that right, for the ICM, and her current work has brought her closer to working with ICM and member associations. So, over to you, Petra. Thank you very much, Sarah. <coughs> Thank you for that introduction. Let me just correct on the former ICM Secretary General. Um, I was with ICM from 1998 to 2003, and um, then went on to do the partnership for maternal new and child health um, at WHO. So after having been away from maternal health for a couple of years, what we're doing now at ICS Integrare and what I'm about to present to you today um, is really very helpful and, and nice to get me back and closer in, the, in the connection again with both my former areas of work, both the partnership and ICM. So first of all, happy um, for the International Day of Midwife to everyone. Thank you that there are so many of you online. I see we have 110 participants and the number's still going up, so that's quite impressive. Um, it's like a really full room. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about something very different from the previous session. This is really much more from a, from a global health perspective, from a, you know how can we improve access and, uh, and quality of midwifery care. Um, in countries where there are still a lot of women dying, uh, obviously needlessly. So what um, we've decided, or what we started to do together with the, the UN agencies, WHO, UNFPA, UNICEF and others, the World Bank, um, but also with a lot of NGOs in countries and um, a lot of support from uh, large groups like uh, Jupaigo and CARE, etc., is to try to get a sense of what's going on with the midwifery workforce or the maternal newborn health workforce, so not just midwives, all the people who work in maternal health, um, in countries where maternal mortality and newborn mortality rates are still very, very high. So why is it that it's difficult for them to, uh, to get access to midwives? What's going on in the labour market, not just um, you know, what's going on with, uh, are there enough of, the, of them, uh, of M&H workers or midwifery workers? But what's going on? Why is it that they're not available to all the women who need them? Next slide. Um, so, so I'm going to give you a little bit of, a, of the background, how um, this came about, why we're doing this, um, what a midwifery um, workforce assessment is, how to do it, and then looking at what what is the outcome, what are the results, what do you do with them, how do you read them once they've been developed. So the background of uh, the internet of this work is it really comes from um, a large um, set of things that happen at the at the same time. Um, in 2010, next to the uh, women deliver. Symposium. There was uh, a midwifery symposium in Washington D.C., the first ever, and there was a big focus on on midwifery, midwives, and out of that came several initiatives. One was to, um, you know, help countries look and further develop their their workforce. Um, others were to to strengthen uh, country and initiatives and, and work that countries have done. Um, and also to, to create um, better intelligence, more um, literature around midwifery. Um, the work out of, uh, of this, uh, the, the proposals that came forward, went to a meeting called the Green Tree Meeting, which took place in, in September of 2011, and where quite a few ministers of health, um, in response to the State of the World Midwifery Report, which was launched at ICM in, in 2011, also said that it's important for them to have an opportunity to, to look at their workforce assessments and their workforce in, in particular. So in the left side of this slide, you see the eight countries who um, at the Green Tree Meeting decided that they wanted to have a midwifery workforce assessment done. Um, you'll see in the, in the slide underneath what the, 
uh, mortality, maternal mortality uh, numbers are in those countries in, in the middle bit. And you know, you'll note that this together, uh, these countries together, contribute 60% of the global maternal mortality. In addition to that, several other countries um, working with Muskoka Fund, which is um, a, a Canadian and, and French francophone um, initiative to reduce maternal mortality, uh, decided that they would also like these literary workforce assessments undertaken. So a couple of uh, others are using the same methodology with support from um, Integrare, we're the secretariat for this work, but also working with other partners to get a better sense of what happens with the workforce, literary workforce in their country. So what you see um, at the, in, in this um, slide is that there are, there's a great interest for doing work, there's a great interest for finding out what's going on and why there are so many complications. And um, every country that we're doing at the moment, we've done Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. Um, the Muscova countries are starting up, of which DR Congo is the furthest. And next on our list are Mozambique, Nigeria, South Africa, um, and, and hopefully also Mexico. Um, what you're seeing is that the situation is very different in every country. So. The way we're doing the work, the analysis, is really to give, uh, uh, to give the opportunity for countries to understand what specifically for them um, are the issues they need to address. So if we look at the global agenda, because of course this also feeds into a lot of the work that has to happen in the post-MDG, the Millennium Development Goals will come to an end officially at the end of 2015. So there's already a big discussion going on around what are the next steps, what are we going to do after um, the 2015, the, the end of the, the MDGs in 2015. And the issue there is that there are a lot of issues scrambling for attention. Health is not only and not uh, and definitely not the primary goal anymore. Sustainable development, um, economic, uh, economic strength. Uh, reducing poverty, those are all things that are very um, very visible and very high on the agenda, climate change, uh, of course, as well. So health is going to be in a subset, in a, in a much larger subset of topics um, than it was in the MDGs where it was very prominent. So as you see this calendar, there are quite a few opportunities in which we're going to be able to um, put together and, and, and strengthen the, the understanding for many people, not just in these countries where we're doing assessments of the importance of a midwifery workforce. Now, there are a lot of goals and ideas that you can um, want to make happen, but unless you have the people who, who are going to do this and um, you know, the policies are going to be implemented and are carried out by, health or work, by a health workforce, nothing is potentially going to change. So well, the overall arching question that we looked at is what is the appropriate midwifery workforce and other countries will call it maternal health or maternal newborn health workforce or a productive maternal newborn health workforce. How is it best deployed? So how does it best get to the areas where it needs to be? To equitably deliver essential MH interventions at scale and at quality. Equitably deliver, with that we mean that everybody has access to them, no matter if they're rich or poor, um, no matter if they're far away or close to a health facility. The essential m &H interventions are those that have been agreed as the life-saving ones um, and those that are essential to prevent uh, and treat complications as they start. At scale means that they are um, available to everyone, so to 100% coverage, to the best possible coverage in a country, and at quality, which means that they need to be provided by um, people who are fully competent in midwifery or in maternal newborn child health. And what, including costs, needs to be put in place to achieve this universal, universal access. So you'll see the emphasis is on equity, everybody needs to have access, quality, and effective coverage. So this is a very complicated slide, and um, I'm going to just explain it really briefly to you, um, but it's, if you, in case you want to look back at it in more detail. So what we do first is a desk review, which is what we call the preparation. We look at what's happening in the country, um, what's the need in the country, and what is the availability of, of staff in a country. And we look in that regard at, uh, at things like policies. What are the policies that determine or that define where midwifery services are provided, where um, you know where the uh, what what the, the health system can do, how supportive it can be to 
fertile health, how is it financed, what are the needs of the population, how many pregnancies can we expect, and we project that, and you'll see that in one of the further slides, up to 2025. Um, and what are then the care needs? What are the people who are working in midwifery or in maternal health doing? Who is doing what? What do the nurse midwives do? What do the auxiliaries do? Are there roles for community health workers? What about the secondary and tertiary levels of care? And then we look at the at the triple H union, um, access availability, accessibility, acceptability and the quality of care. So after we've done this analysis and we've looked at all these core data. We identify if there are any gaps. You know, what are we missing? For example, in, in uh, Tanzania, we were missing what people were actually doing at a facility level. How do we how do we see, how do we know what um, a midwife is doing, what a nurse is doing, what a doctor is doing, do they refer, do they what do they take care of themselves, for example, uh, with regard to postpartum hemorrhage or obstructed labor? Um, what do the are the issues that they, or the, uh, the complications that they send on, do they categorically send everything on, which was the case in some facilities. So how, uh, how, is, how does it work and how much time do MNH workforce, as they're called in, in Tanzania, spend in actual prevention and treatment um, and, and the basic assessment that are needed for maternal and, and newborn health? Because you can see that sometimes if people have more than one skill or have have a you know they're they're a nurse midwife and they can do other things they could also be pulled into A and E or they could be pulled into HIV programs and in essence that means that their capacity for a hundred percent time spent on maternal newborn health is reduced. So we do um, we we find together with uh, local research institutions and also with local midwives and and, and nursing and, and OBGYN associations. We try to find the, the data that are needed to give us a better detailed picture, um, and not only looking at what happens in, in the generally in the country, but also at a disaggregated level, so that we can see exactly what's going on in, in the more remote and rural areas. So, with all those data together, we then do an analysis of what is um, where is midwifery, who is this, um, accessing it. Um, and what is the effective coverage? Does the country want to go to 100% coverage? Is it looking at 50 or 60 percent? Has it set goals for itself to reach 100 by 2010, 2015, 2020? And then we we, we kind of make a set of what we call costed policy options. So we say if you in, increase training, then that will cost so much, but it, and it will reach so much. But if you then don't also improve deployment or provide incentives for retention in remote, remote and rural areas, etc. So we, we develop what we are calling costed scenarios, so that a government has a real notion, a real understanding of if we take this option, this is what it's going to cost and this is what it's going to bring us. Because ultimately, a Minister of Health um, who wants to improve maternal and newborn health is going to have to negotiate for funds with the Minister of Finance. And he'll need a lot of political policy, which will set financial arguments to make his case. So this is uh, one of the first steps, and it's really interesting uh, way um, of looking at what's going to happen in a country. Um, we we kind of pull together the pregnancies, and um, the redder the more pregnancies um, that there are to be expected. Um, so we, we look at where people live and um, we calculate how many pregnancies uh, based on a, on a total fertility rate, um, taking out uh, certain percentages for uh, spontaneous abortion carriages and, and things like that. Um, and we, uh, we have a get a sense, we can give a picture for, say, this is a stand standalone picture for three countries, but we also give for example, three pictures for Afghanistan, in which you can see by the change in the colour where people are, where where more pregnancies are to be expected, which helps a government tailor some of its planning to the areas where the need will be greater in 2010 or 2020 or 2025. And then we look at what is the, um, you know, what are the people who are doing um, these services, who are provide, who's providing what. Um, and we do that per essential intervention. So WHO and the Partnerships for Maternal Newborn and Child Health have, have made a list of the essential interventions for maternal and newborn health. And they start, you know, all the way in, in basic screening, et cetera, et cetera, but also things like 
dead nets and tetanus and um, you know mal uh, um, HRV and all those kind of things. So all these essential interventions are then assessed per um, per provider. So how about, what do CHW do and what do nurses do and what do community midwives do? What do OBGYNs do? So that we can get a kind of a sense of. So the main providers in the MNH workforce in this country are X, Y, and Z, and we usually come up with um, a group of three or four cardos or community health workers and cardos as a combination um, who provide the services, which means we can then target um, much more of our data collection and the details that we need um, on what they're providing. So if we then look at uh, at what the whole labour market look, looks like and how that how that works, I mean this is not a, a health system or a health related issue only. It's really um, you know the the whole any kind of a labour market looks looks like you know looks at what are what is our pipeline? How are we going to be? Uh, how are we going to look at the people that are going to come into a certain area of work or in a certain profession in the future? So you start from high school graduates and you look at how many of those stream into healthcare education and training. Out of those, how many are then qualified, which gives you a sense of what your potential supply is. From those, you'll have several that are employed because a lot of the um, employment run through the central government. So there are certain numbers of positions available, um, obviously based on funding, but also um, based on some of the economic uh, situations and criteria that are determined and, and agreed with the World Bank um, as conditions for loans and the, and the IMF. So there are a lot of influences on how many people can be employed. Some of them will be unemployed, some of them will have exited to other jobs. So how many are unemployed and actually then go into the health sector, because there could be some that go into something else, either into academia, or into pharmaceuticals, etc. And then out of those, how many come into the public and into the private uh, go into the private um, sector. So you'll see if you look at the big bar of uh, high school graduates at the bottom, how many you could potentially be left with in, in the public sector, who would then be available to be sent uh, or to go to uh, to take care of uh, people that need these specific services. So if we're looking uh, then at how many, what the cost is, um, is one of the things that we try to uh, to address. Um, so what does it cost to train a midwife? What does it cost to train a nurse? What does it cost to train an auxiliary? Um, uh, what does it cost to train a community health worker? And then compare that to what they do in the slide that we showed you earlier. I showed you earlier, you can get a sense as to you know, what is the best economic benefit? What is the group of uh, providers that we can educate for uh, a relatively affordable cost and, and who can um, per, kind of cover as many as possible of the essential interventions so that you have a lot of skills in the hands of one person. And then you have the, the issues of what is what the AAA key, as we call it, work like. So if you look at what's available, we have a, on the left there's a situation in the, in the rural um, areas of the country and on the right is, it's in the urban areas. So availability in in um, uh, in the rural area um, is is quite a lot lower than available availability in the higher area. So the mean, the, the purple blob, is on uh, on the left, uh, more to the left of the middle of the the chart on the left hand side in the rural side than on the right hand side in urban. So there 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 are more people available in the urban areas. Um, they're also easily more easily accessible in urban areas. So you see that even though they are available, um, accessibility has, has an impact on that. And there are many areas in the world where, despite living in a city, people are still very poor and being able to access services um, has a financial cost. If you look at accessibility in a, in a rural area, of course, their transportation and distance take an impact. So you see that's why the purple blob has gone even further to, to the left. Look, moving up to acceptability, which is really um, our, our providers um, giving the kinds of services that women find accessible, acceptable. Are they culturally correct? Do they kind of respond to the needs of women? Um, are they acceptable in, in the community and in the culture and in the family of the women? Um, both of those in rural and in urban situations um, make, make the availability, of, the total availability and recovery of, of skills, birth attendants and midwives um, much lower. 
Um, and then, of course, the number of times that you, you actually contact, is that there are um, how many people really actually go to these services, despite that they would be available, accessible, and acceptable, um, reduces the number. So that at the top you find what effectively, so if you, you calculate uh, around 45%, um, if you look at the, on the left, on the, in the rural, 45%, um, that would be available effectively, about 10% are going to be used. And in the urban areas, there would be 80% available effectively. Um, you know, there would be about uh, 30, 30 to 40%, maybe probably just about 30% that's actually effectively going to be used. So if a country has a, a, a coverage target, as they're saying, they want the country to be covered for 60% by accessible, available, acceptable skilled birth attendants or m &H services, then just because of this, impact of one of the, on top of the, the other, um, they'd have to put a lot more in, energy into making them available, accessible, and acceptable to get to their 60% target. So those are interesting pieces of information for a government to understand and tweak their policies on. So if you then look at what you have, you know, what the, what the story is, on the left of this, this you see the stock. So this is the number of um, work, the, the workforce there currently is. And on the right-hand side, in year X, so as I was saying, we, we model for 2020 and 2025, you see exactly how much you need. And of course, you can use the need or and, and put in a service target. So if we've here projected for 100%, but you could imagine that a country that's only, projected, that's only wanting to cover 60% um, would have a lower bar at the, on the right-hand side. So between the stock, the number of people that there are, and what you need, usually people make a kind of a linear decision. So, okay, we need to train more midwives, we need to train more doctors, we need to have community health workers who can do more X, Y, and Z, etc. But if you look at the, the small graph in the middle, actually the story is a little bit more complicated because of the, you know, entering into the um, into the education stream, those that come out of the education stream. You'd think there were as many as went in, but there are quite a few that lose that you lose along the way, other you know, because they go to another area of work, or because they uh, they find that they don't get employed, or because they don't get to the place where they're supposed to be working. So in en in essence, though, you think uh, if you add the stock plus the entry, you would have about 60 or 70 percent of your needs covered. In essence, you only have 30, 50 percent or 45 percent covered, and the gap is much larger. So all these are ways of making it insightful for governments to find their way through this maze of impacts and influences on the middle of free and maternal and rural health workforce. So in the, in the report that we're doing, this is an example from Ethiopia, we provide what we call an infographic, which is um, a piece that, that really, in a very short, uh, in, a, in a quick overview, gives a, a need, um, gives an impact, a, a, an image of what the situation is in the country. So of course, you know, you, you have what the situation is, the needs, the supply, what the gap is, and then what the strategies are for, for getting um, getting midwifery or the maternal and rural health services out there. So this is uh, something that then for policymakers um, and for um, development partners, international organisations, but also midwives and midwifery associations over DYNs um, becomes a very easy uh, easy to understand and easy to use tool that will um, help them in their discussions and their negotiations with the government as to um, how to improve services. Because of course, in, in addition to this, this is the workforce component, there are also a lot of um, other tools that have already been developed and that are being, um, being used in these negotiations that talk about the health system, uh, the quality of the facilities, the reachability and, the, and the, um, the, the accessibility of the services at the facility. You know, have they got full equipment? Can they do all the life-saving interventions? So then you, you have the two biggest impacts on uh, M&A services in the country. What are the facilities like? How can people get there, et cetera? But also, what is the workforce that, that supports? So this is the last slide with some information on um, the main people who are, are working on this. Um, Jim and myself are both uh, are based in, in uh, Integrare. I work out of the Geneva area and Jim works from Barcelona and 
our main um, connection for this work, our main uh, person that we work with is um, Dr. Lisa Bernice at uh, UNSPA in Geneva as well. Um, he works on this topic on behalf of what they call the H4 um, Plus, which are the UN AIDS organization, the UN organization, sorry, that are, that are concerned with maternal and newborn health. So WHO, UNSPF, UNSPA, the World Bank, um, UN AIDS and UN Women. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, any questions for clarification, please um, do feel free to let me know. And um, then, of course, we can start a, a longer discussion on some of the areas that you might want to give me your opinion and your suggestions on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? I can see this writing in the chat box. It was a great presentation, Petra. Amazing work. It's really interesting. Very rewarding as well. Well, yes, because it's about the um, midwifery workforce, but also because it, it really just you know it's life saving, and I think that's in, in very very um, important. Mm. Okay, I have a too. from Nicole. I'll just go ahead, um, Nicole, I'll, ask, I'll answer that in, uh, in writing. Um, some of the training innovations um, are to use more um, of the, the current um, e-technologies for learning, but specifically trying to um, keep find people to enter into midwifery schools that will go back to the communities that they come from. What you see is when people in, in many um, countries that we work in, find, uh, get an education and, and get a profession, they all tend to want to go to the larger agglomerations, either the, the capital city or some of the larger cities, whereas in, re in, in essence they really, um, you know, they are so much needed um, in the remote and rural areas. So some of the ideas around that have been to put um, midwifery and nursing schools in the remote and rural areas so that they are very close to where they are, others are for communities to put forward um, their pupils to go to these schools so that they will then also go back to their communities when they've, uh, when they've finished uh, their, their education. So there's, there's quite a lot of, uh, of ways in, in which there are, um, you know, people are looking at making it more attractive to increase coverage by staying close to where you're from and it also makes services more acceptable because you know your culture intimately and would um, you know be better be, be very well placed in um, making services available that that people really um, you know accept and that, that you speak the same language etc so these are only a few there's quite a lot of other ways um, of of being innovative around training um, I'm just going to move on to the next um, area that there are um, online in innovations indeed. Um, I, th I think that's, that's indeed really important. The, the issue though is that connectivity isn't um, ubiquitous in, in, a, in a lot of these countries. So still, um, you know, when you use these online um, mechanisms, you have to be aware that they have to be available to very low bandwidth and, um, you know, they have to be accessed by that. There are um, many more technologies now with mobile phones, which I think we also should um, look at uh, in, in, a, in a way that as a, as a future option for doing educational work. We're, you know, learning about maternal newborn health and, and becoming a, a midwife or a nurse midwife or, a, or, or whatever the, the kind of title might be really does need 50% hands-on work. Um, and I think that is not able you can't learn that um, online. You have to learn that in a clinical setting. 
So um, obviously, it would only be half useful, I think. Moving on to, to Caroline's question. Uh, yes, there is definitely um, interest in expanding this work. Um, we've had interest from um, Mexico and South Africa as countries that aren't in the original group of eight. We've seen the Muskoka, the Francophone African countries, adding to the group. And in essence, what, we, what we'd like to be able to do is to create a, a body of knowledge and a body of uh, consultants and, and support through the Secretariat and together with the H4 um, that they can really uh, give the, uh, you know, do, carry these out. So we're going to write, we have, we're working along a, an operational guidance and framework that we would um, write, like to make available. We're looking to publish that um, in September so that more people can um, put the, uh, put, use the system uh, and, and hopefully then, uh, you know, produce quality because I think that's important. Um, similarly to the emergency of such a care ways of uh, an analyzing um, what the facilities can do in emergency of such a cases. How uh, can we explain why there's a conflict in working with um, it depends a little bit um, on, on, on the countries that you're in. Um, the ones that we've been working in, um, a lot of, the, as I was saying, a lot of the uh, deployment, uh, the recruitment and deployment and also retention of midwives and midwifery workforce goes through the government. So that means there is a large bureaucracy and administrative mechanism um, on top of which sometimes there are what we call ceilings imposed by uh, development partners, either the World Bank or IMF or others, um, who are saying you can only um, use an X percentage of your budget and of your health budget to staff the rest you have to use for X, Y, Z other topics. And um, that may, means that it's hard for the people to, uh, for governments to actually um, deploy and, and spend and retain in remote and rural areas those, um, the staff that they would like. In the situation of Tanzania, which is one of the countries we analysed, um, we found that about 50% of the high school, of the, the midwifery education or the health education graduates um, lost, were lost in the deployment chain. So 50% of them didn't quote unquote survive or didn't last between coming out of their education program and staying in post for one year. So those are areas where uh, you know, where there's definitely a lot that can be um, um, improved. There are other ways, um, you know, that governments are trying to approach this by having recruitment happen locally, um, which is also sometimes um, easier or sometimes not. Um, it, it's still a bit of a struggle. And as you will probably know, health workforce is not really at the top of everybody's agenda of theirs. You know, it's saving lives and, and those are the big topic, HIV, now the non-communicable diseases. So, um, you know, it's, it, when you're working on health workforce issues, it's a constant uh, debate to convince people that without the workforce, all their beautiful targets and programs won't be, uh, won't be achieved. Um, yes, in some areas, midwives are, are costly indeed. Um, however, there are also many places where um, you know, mid midwifery is provided by other kinds of uh, of, of cardos, um, enrolled nurses, um, others with a, a good, uh, with you know, who take a role, who are take a, a key role in providing m and services, and and that can be um, very uh, challenging because on the one hand you want the quality of care, on the other hand you are looking at the reality on the ground. Um, so that it's a question of really, you know, being strategic and, and, and creative um, in getting getting midwifery um, midwifery out there. In essence, I think the uh, the workforce is costly. In many countries, workforce takes up about um, 60 to 70 percent of the health budget. In, in, many, in other countries, even more. So I don't think we're going to say ever be able to say that this is a a quick, uh, you know, a quick fix or a low hanging fruit. It's a, it's a sustained effort um, that will reap results in the long term, but that's important for people to want to and have to invest in. Um, yes, I think um, 
Um, we have uh, cost estimates for deployments, as I was saying in uh, uh, just to answer Michaela's question. Um, we have done those um, in the in the areas where deployment is, is the main issue. Um, in Bangladesh, deployment obviously will go to rural is an issue in urban, it's a lot stronger already. Um, and the new midwives are being, are being trained there. Um, but deployment really means um, adding on a cost for incentives, but in many cases, for example, also schooling for children, housing, uh, ways that things that will make people uh, stay in, in the remote and rural areas and actually kind of build their life there without. Um, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to do this for three or five years and then I'm free to go wherever I want, which means capital city or outside the country, effectively. Um, some of the cost estimates around that uh, are also to do, uh, or would also include supportive supervision um, and ways in which people uh, can make better use of the, the services that are around them. Sarah, you're asking um, what sort of provision did you encounter relating to maternity care assistance and support workers? Um, are you are you asking whether or not we found them and what they do, or um, are you asking what kind of support these people are are receiving? Which provision are you looking for? Uh, yes, well, there's always um, the preference for the, the low-hanging fruit and the quick fix, um, and, and that's, not a, that's not only or not mainly governments, actually, and often at times it's, uh, it's the development partners who ask for, who push for a, uh, a quick result um, and give countries uh, uh, an amount of years to make an imp improvement and uh, then ex expect them to be able to sustain that improvement from their own funds, which doesn't always work. So. Yeah, there are um, uh, there there are obviously uh, what you see is a lot of um, results of these quick fixes. So large numbers of community health workers, for example, uh, um, in Tanzania, as I was talking about earlier, um, who have a certain set of tasks, but for example, haven't been taught what the labour the signs of onset of labour are, and and that would be something that would be very useful um, for people to uh, to be able to send women on or to to kind of keep tabs on or to inform um, you know other kinds of the kind of health care provider or the midwives around them to say she's starting in labor etc so there's a lot of uh, of kind of uh, little pools of um, program and, and impact that you can see that haven't been joined up it's a bit of a join the dots sometimes and then there's uh, uh, of course the, the issues around um, uh, you know what that makes what a, what the government really wants, which isn't always all these projects. There are also governments that are proactively rejecting small projects for trained community health workers like this, or or you know, or make birthing kits available, or do this or do that. They want a full, long-term, sustained program. And I think one of the results of the um, the work on the focus on the Millennium Development Goals is that we're starting to see that that long-term thinking is needed and that the in invent or the um, investment in quality, um, for example, had we in 1987, when the Safe Motherhood Initiative was, t was uh, taken, started out with, uh, you know, midwifery programs um, that would give a fully competent midwife to international or, or whatever the name is, it doesn't have to be midwife, no, midwife, I'm not talking about specific title, but if it had trained to the, to the kind of continuum of care covering quality professional, then we would have already have had a much stronger impact on the on maternal and newborn health, I think. Yes, I see you agree, Nicole. Wonderful. Are there any more questions? No? Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Petra. Um, I really, really enjoyed it, and I, I think you've generated some really, really interesting discussions. Um, it's quite inspirational what you do, and thank you so much for giving up all your time for us, and I would really hope for an update next year.
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Going. Just to just to say that uh, you have our contact details here. If you're working in a country or you know a country, um, I'm just getting the questions about the OECD countries. Um, if you wish, think that there would be interest, um, then you know please don't hesitate to write. Um, of course, it has to be a government initiative. They ultimately have to be the ones coming to the H4 plus to say we would like a, a workforce assessment. But um, you know that can always be achieved, be achieved through very many um, routes and ways. So feel free to, to start the ball rolling if you know it's going to be um, uh, if you know it's going to be uh, of interest or of, uh, of effect in the country that you're working in. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm going